Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. If you'd been among the small gathering of believers in the home of Philemon in Colossae on that day that this letter arrived by the hand of Tychicus and Onesimus, brought all the way from Rome, where Paul was imprisoned. I wonder whether you would have felt a jarring change of tone, a sort of unexpected change of subject at this point of the letter, as you listened to Tychicus read. Through the first half of what we call chapter 3, they heard that magnificent description of the life of the one who believes in Christ Jesus, the wonder of our union with Christ, past, present and future, chapter 3 verses 1 to 4, the transformation of the life that is united to Christ, chapter 3 verses 5 through to 11, the quality of that life, chapter 3 verses 12 to 17. And then we come to chapter 3, verse 18. Now, I'm not for the moment uh, alluding to the awkwardness that we in our society and culture have with the words of Colossians 3, verse 18. I even heard a murmur as I read it a few moments ago. <laughs> I'm going to say a word about that in a moment, not the murmuring, but the, uh, how we feel about those words when we hear them in our culture. The more important thing uh, if I may say so, is to sense the astonishing shift from the cosmic work of Christ, reconciling all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, to this tiny domestic scene. Wife, husband, children. We need to appreciate that when Paul turns to say something about family life, for those united to Christ. He is still talking about the consequences of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. If that event of immense effect is intended to bring order and peace back to the chaos of all things, then we must understand that this same Christ, this same work of Christ, brings order and peace to the family to your family, my family. Before we concentrate on the details, the specific details of these four verses, I want to draw your attention to their general shape. I am immediately struck by their brevity. Uh, I don't know what I would say if I was asked to say something significant about the Christian family in less than 50 words. That is, if I hadn't read Colossians, if I was asked to do this, I'd just pinch what Paul said now, of course. <laughs> and of course, in another place, namely in the fifth chapter of Ephesians, Paul does elaborate somewhat on these brief lines. Nonetheless, the very brevity of what Paul says here encourages me to think that he may well be telling us something essential. This is what he chooses to say when he only has 50 words. The second thing I notice is that these words are about an ordered household, the way in which the wife is to relate to the husband, the husband to the wife, the children to the parents, the father to the children. Uh, earlier Paul told his readers that he was, in chapter 2 verse 5, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Faith in Christ brings order to life reorders life, brings order to the chaos, just as he brings order to the totality of all things. One place where this good order is to be seen is the marriages of believers, the families of believers. Now what is meant by order we'll come to when we look at the details of these verses, but even before we get there I want us to notice that just the general shape of what Paul says here and the context in this particular letter clearly implies that marriages, families, 
need to be redeemed. Marriage and the family are not institutions that have somehow escaped the ravages of the fall. They can be places of terrible chaos, darkness, hurt, yes, wickedness. We sometimes, I think perhaps often, have a sentimental view of marriage and the family. Those of us unmarried need to realise this as well as those who are married. Marriage and family is not itself a haven from the chaos where your sinfulness will do no harm, where you will be unharmed by the sinfulness of others. The married and the unmarried among us sometimes think like that, I think, either in longing or in pretense. We think of a marriage or a family where we could just be ourselves. We can just let our hair down. There is no need for restraints. It's a place of safety and haven like that. But everything human needs redemption. We are dangerously deceived if we hope that a life situation will by itself bring us peace and security and happiness. I do suspect that many of us are unrealistic about our marriages and families, or the marriages and families of others. We have, of course, these days our own particular culturally conditioned kind of sentimentality. And this is the view that freedom from restraint is the path to fulfilment and happiness. And if we cannot be free from restraint in our home, if we cannot be relaxed and unguarded and undisciplined in our own family, then where can we be? And the answer that I believe the Bible gives us is terribly unsettling to our culture and to our minds that are so affected by our culture. And it is that nowhere, nowhere this side of heaven is it safe for us to simply be ourselves not until ourselves have become the fully redeemed sons of God. This doesn't mean that there is no difference between life in my home and life outside it. It just means that it's no more safe in my family than anywhere else to pursue happiness simply through personal and unrestrained freedom. The order of life in my family will certainly be different from the order of life outside it. In some ways it will be more difficult for it is more intimate. The call of the words of scripture that come to us this day is to know the redeeming power of Christ and his work in your marriage and in your family life. And so we ask, what shape does the redemption of Christ bring to marriage and family. And Paul provides us with this brief but profound outline. A word to wives, a word to husbands, a word to children, a word to fathers. One verse each. Verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. It's important for us to appreciate, and it is very difficult for us to appreciate, uh, therefore all the more important to put the effort in, that the reason that these words are so appalling to our ears, it is that two related ideas have become embedded in the consciousness of our culture. The first I've referred to already, namely that human happiness is found in a kind of independent freedom. These words seem to deny that freedom and therefore the possibility of happiness to wives. Now how atrocious is that? The second idea is that a person who subordinates him or herself to another is thereby diminished as a person. These words seem therefore to make wives inferior 
to husbands. The offence of Colossians chapter 3 verse 18 to our ears, the offence of many similar statements we must say in the pages of the New Testament is unavoidable if you accept those two ideas. It should be unavoidable at least. Sometimes I think I see Christian people who retain those two ideas then insisting that Colossians chapter 3 verse 18 is the word of God accept the offensive conclusions that husbands have a freedom to pursue their own happiness that wives do not and husbands are in this kind of sense somehow superior to their wives the problem is not with being offended by such conclusions I want you to be offended by them the problem is the utterly unchristian ideas that draw these conclusions from this word of God. Our new life in Christ is very, very different from our culture's notions of liberation. Do you remember and cast, cast your eyes back to the uh, paragraph that we looked at last time, I think it was from chapter 3 verse 12 and following where we heard that those who've died with Christ and been raised with Christ and will appear with Christ in glory are to live lives now of compassion, not freedom from the demands of others, kindness, not self-centred independence, humility, not superiority, meekness, not assertiveness, Patience, not impatience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. Above all, the new life in Christ puts on love. And only this radical understanding of life as Christ shapes it, life as Christ reorders it, life as Christ fixes it up, only with, with this understanding can we sensibly approach the particulars of family life in Christ. What then, we ask, does Paul mean by wives submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord? <coughs> submit translates a Greek word that could literally be represented as order under. Put yourself under is the general idea. The really striking thing is how often this particular word appears in the New Testament to describe how Christians are to live. Let me give you a quick picture of it. Putting ourselves under another is a characteristic, it would seem, of the Christian life. We are to put ourselves under God in Hebrews 12 and James chapter 4. We are to put ourselves under his law, it would seem, from Romans chapter 8. We are to put ourselves under Christ from Ephesians 5. We are to put ourselves under the governing authorities, Romans 13 and Titus 3 and 1 Peter 2. We are put out to put ourselves under ministers of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 16. Slaves are to put themselves under their masters, Titus 2, 1 Peter 2. Young men are to put themselves under older men, 1 Peter 5. Children are put to put themselves under parents, Luke chapter 2. Wives under husbands. Uh, Ephesians 5, Titus 2, 1 Peter 3, and of course our Colossians 3 text here. Indeed, there is the rather striking ex exhortation to believers in Ephesians 5 verse 21, put yourselves under one another out of reverence for Christ. Now on the basis of this sort of sweeping material uh, running through the New Testament, uh, it, it has sometimes been reasonably argued that the New Testament teaches a subordinationist ethic. This is the way in which the new humanity is constituted. It's the way in which the disintegration of human society is to be redeemed, not by individual liberation from restraints and obligations to others, but by each one gladly placing him or herself under the ones God has placed over us. In the case of wives, we must notice Paul affirms that to place themselves under their husbands is fitting in the Lord. Not an accommodation to an ancient patriarchal society, but fitting 
in the Lord. In Christ, there is a proper order. And the husband, as Paul puts it elsewhere, is the head of the wife. Now, hasn't helped you yet all that much, has it? And I want to say that we must, just as we must not capitulate to secular liberationist philosophies here, we must also take care that we are not captive to our own human traditions. In some measure, the liberationist philosophies have been in reaction to the inexcusable conduct of some men, and at times some Christian men. See, this very teaching that we're looking at uh, today has sometimes been taken by men and provided a framework for the most appalling chauvinism, self-centred, greedy assertiveness, a husband requiring his wife to meet his needs, to serve his interests, to fulfil his desires, to bow to his selfish will. It can be very ugly indeed. And it is no wonder that with such horrors in the background that many of us feel a certain attraction to the liberationist philosophies. But they are a false answer. The Bible's answer is to understand the character of the husband's headship under which the Christian wife is called to put herself. The word to wives, therefore, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, must be understood in the light of the word to husbands in verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. The husband's responsibility, his solemn, God-given responsibility, is the well-being of his wife. Husbands, love your wives. It has always been too easy for a man to say, I love you, to a woman. The word to husbands here is not a call to utter the words, but to live the reality. Husbands, love your wives. And again, in a full recognition of our need of redemption and that our marriages need redemption and the rejection of any sentimental view of marriage, the very real tendency from which husbands need to be delivered is identified and do not be harsh with them. We could translate that, do not become bitter towards them. How tragically ever present is the possibility of bitterness in marriage, perhaps particularly for a husband. When a wife disappoints a husband's hopes and ambitions, when she does not live up to his unrealistic ideals for her, bitterness and then harshness are close at hand. Husbands, love your wives. And do not be harsh with them. Do not become bitter. There is no more place for selfishness and self-centred liberty, for self-seeking assertiveness. There is no more place for these things in a Christian husband than there is in a Christian wife. And it is ever so important for us to see that wives are called to put themselves under husbands who are called to love them. That's how it works, you see. The idea in this context is not first and foremost to the wife to place yourself under the authority of your husband, but to place yourself under his love. Now I want to think about this distinctively Christian way of understanding life for just a little further. Um, I mentioned earlier that the New Testament is sometimes said to, pre to present a subordinationist ethic and we notice the range of situations in which believers are called to place themselves under others. In each case, if you work your way through them, the one whom we are called to submit to is one who has responsibility for our welfare. 
It goes against the grain, I know, of the liberationist philosophies, but the reordering of life, the fixing up of the mess that this world has got itself into, that our lives have got themselves into, the fixing up of the mess that comes with Christ involves not the assertion of independence, but the embracing of dependence. This is how it is with Christ himself. You see, he is our saviour. But we receive his salvation by submitting to him as Lord. Yes, this does involve his authority, but it is authority for our good by his grace. And it is just impossible to say, I want Christ's salvation, but I want to be independent. I do not want to submit to him. No, he is our saviour by being our Lord. It's the same in all other areas of Christian submission. Submission is never permission for authoritarian tyranny or bullying. But care can only be given to the one who submits to the care. Christian ministry is like this, friends. Christian ministry is service, care. And it is a terrible thing when Christian ministry is used to bully and boss. But there are times when a Christian person complains that they are not being cared for as they would like to be and they are the very people who refuse to submit to the ministry that they insist should be caring for them. It often happens in churches. The people with limited commitment to the fellowship who come along when they feel like it and when it is convenient, who, who accept no measure of authority from the pastor over their lives, they are the very people who will often be the ones who complain that they are not being cared for. Now, I hope that you are not hearing me suggest that this is a one-sided matter. Indeed, that is the very point I want us to see. Wives submit to your husbands makes full sense only alongside Husbands, love your wives. The fulfilment of each side of this relationship is dependent on the other. Husbands must take some responsibility for making their wife's, their wife's submission to them a good and joyful thing. Wives must take some responsibility for making their husbands loving them a good and joyful thing. It will be for each husband and each wife, hearing these words, to work out in your situation what it means for Christ to be your Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. The next word is to children and will be briefer for reasons that I think are probably obvious. Verse 20, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Or better, this is pleasing in the Lord. Uh, it's echoing verse 18, as is fitting in the Lord. I've always liked the T-shirt. I haven't seen it around lately, but it was around when uh, my children were younger. Uh, Moya didn't wear it, mind you. I was tempted to give it to her from time to time. The T-shirt that had a blazoned across the front, because I'm the mother, that's why. Uh, it expresses the sort of understandable, normal and very common frustration at the child who from about the age of two or three questions why he or she needs to do as they are told. But while I like the t-shirt, and I really should have given it to Moyer, I think, <laughs> I would not like it to be a true statement of my relationships as a parent. The obedience of children is not for the sake of the parents. Not first. The obedience of the children is to those who are responsible to care for them. The authority of their parent is to be exercised for the care of the child. That's the context of the obedience that is called for. Disobedient children contribute to dysfunctional families, but chiefly because their disobedience hinders their parents' love and care. Uh, this, by the way, should help us to see the force of the words in everything and to see that this obedience changes as a child grows up. The obedience required corresponds 
to the parent's responsibility. And as the scope of the parent's responsibility changes over time, so does the scope of the obedience required. I take it that in everything points to the comprehensive nature of parents' responsibility for children in their dependent years. Well, finally, uh, let us come to the last uh, word here. Um, Paul turns to fathers. Although this word no doubt applies to mothers too, perhaps fathers are more typically in need of this word. Verse 21, fathers do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Now, very briefly, what kind of behaviour on the part of fathers does Paul have in mind here? I think that most of us, especially fathers, have a pretty good idea. Uh, it's those words, it's those actions, or perhaps it is the absence of those words and the absence of those actions that make our children fearful and timid and lacking in normal self-confidence. Uh, it's not uncommon for strong fathers to bemoan the fact that their children are so unconfident, when what has happened, in fact, is that they have used their strength to crush and undermine their children. Fathers especially have a responsibility to support and encourage their children. Well, friends, we've been listening to four brilliant sentences from the Scriptures Sketching for us, yes, in bare outline, yes, leaving us to work out the concrete expression of these relationships in our own marriages and families, but here is the essential shape of marriages and families, marriage and family life, under the controlling, reconciling lordship of Jesus Christ. We need these words. Because our families and our marriages are as marred and distorted and fragile as we are. These are healing words. They're redeeming words. They're constructive words for wives, for husbands, for children, for parents, and for all of us who care about Christian marriages and Christian families. Kingdom.